Section 93 of The Ontario Readers, Fourth Book. Read for LibriVox.org by The Voice Before the Void on the North Dakota Saskatchewan border. The Voice Before the Void.net. In a Cave with a Whale. Just when the delightful days were beginning to pall upon us, a real adventure befell us, which, had we been attending strictly to business, we should not have encountered. For a week previous we had been cruising constantly, without ever seeing a spout, except those belonging to whales out at sea, whither we knew it was folly to follow them. At last... One afternoon, as we were listlessly lolling, half asleep except the lookout man, across the thwarts, we suddenly came upon a gorge between two cliffs that we must have passed before several times unnoticed. At a certain angle it opened, disclosing a wide sheet of water extending a long distance ahead. I put the helm up, and we ran through the passage, finding it about a boat's length in width, and several fathoms deep, though overhead the cliffs nearly came together in places. The place was new to us, and our languor was temporarily dispelled, and we paddled along, taking in every feature of the shores with keen eyes that let nothing escape. After we had gone on in this placid manner for maybe an hour, we suddenly came to a stupendous cliff, that is, for those parts, rising almost sheer from the water for about a thousand feet. Of itself it would not have arrested our attention, but at its base was a semicircular opening, like the mouth of a small tunnel. This looked alluring, so I headed the boat for it, passing through a deep channel between two reefs which led straight to the opening. There was ample room for us to enter, as we had lowered the mast, but just as we were passing through, a heave of the unnoticed swell lifted us unpleasantly near the crown of this natural arch. Beneath us, at a great depth, the bottom could be dimly discerned, the water being of the richest blue conceivable, which the sun, striking down through, resolved into some most marvelous color schemes in the path of its rays. A delicious sense of coolness, after the fierce heat outside, saluted us as we entered a vast hall, whose roof rose to a minimum height of forty feet, but in places could not be seen at all. A sort of diffused light, weak but sufficient to reveal the general contour of the place, existed let in, I supposed, through some unseen crevices in the roof or walls. At first, of course, to our eyes, fresh from the fierce glare outside, the place seemed wrapped in impenetrable gloom, and we dared not stir lest we should run into some hidden danger. Before many minutes, however, the gloom lightened as our pupils enlarged, so that, although the light was faint, we could find our way about with ease. We spoke in low tones, for the echoes were so numerous and resonant that even a whisper gave back from those massy walls in a series of recurring hisses, as if a colony of snakes had been disturbed. We paddled on into the interior of this vast cave, 
finding everywhere the walls rising sheer from the silent, dark waters. Not a ledge or a crevice where one might gain foothold. Indeed, in some places there was a considerable overhang from above, as if a great dome, whose top was invisible, sprang from some level below the water. We pushed ahead until the tiny semicircle of light through which we had entered was only faintly visible. And then, finding there was nothing to be seen except what we were already witnessing, unless we cared to go on into the thick darkness, which extended apparently into the bowels of the mountain, we turned and started to go back. Do what we would, we could not venture to break the solemn hush that surrounded us, as if we were shut within the dome of some vast cathedral in the twilight. So we paddled noiselessly along for the exit, till suddenly an awful, inexplicable roar set all our hearts thumping fit to break our bosoms, Really, the sensation was most painful, especially as we had not the faintest idea whence the noise came, or what had produced it. Again it filled that immense cave with its thunderous reverberations, but this time all the sting was taken out of it, as we caught sight of its author. A goodly bull humpback had found his way in after us, and the sound of his spout exaggerated a thousand times in the confinement of that mighty cavern, had frightened us all so that we nearly lost our breath. So far, so good. But, unlike the old negro, though we were doing blame well, we did not let blame well alone. The next spout that intruder gave, he was right alongside of us. This was too much for the semi-savage instincts of my gallant harpooner, and before I had time to shout a caution, he had plunged his weapon deep into the old blowhard's broad back. I should like to describe what followed, but, in the first place, I hardly know. And, in the next, even had I been cool and collected, my recollections would sound like the ravings of a fevered dream. For of all the hideous uproars conceivable, that was, I should think, about the worst. The big mammal seemed to have gone frantic with the pain of his wound, the surprise of the attack, and the hampering confinement in which he found himself. His tremendous struggles caused such a commotion that our position could only be compared to that of men shooting Niagara in a cylinder at night. How we kept afloat, I do not know. Someone had the gumption to cut the line, so that by the radiation of the disturbance we presently found ourselves close to the wall, and trying to hold the boat into it with our fingertips. Would he never be quiet, we thought, as the thrashing, banging, and splashing still went on with unfailing vigor? At last, in, I suppose, one supreme effort to escape, he leaped clear of the water like a salmon. There was a perceptible hush, during which we shrank together like unfledged chickens on a frosty night. Then, in a never-to-be-forgotten crash that ought to have brought down the massy roof, that mountainous carcass fell. The consequent violent upheaval of the water should have smashed the boat against the rocky walls. But that final catastrophe was mercifully spared us. I suppose the rebound was sufficient to keep us a safe distance off. A perfect silence succeeded, during which we sat speechless, awaiting a resumption of the clamor. At last Abner broke the heavy silence by saying, I don't see the doorway any more at all, sir. He was right. The tide had risen, and that half-moon of light had disappeared, 
so that we were now prisoners for many hours, it not being at all probable that we should be able to find our way out during the night ebb. Well, we were not exactly children to be afraid of the dark, although there is considerable difference between the velvety darkness of a dungeon and the clear, fresh night of the open air. Still, as long as that beggar of a whale would only keep quiet or leave the premises, we should be fairly comfortable. We waited and waited until an hour had passed, and then came to the conclusion that our friend was either dead or had gone out, as he gave no sign of his presence. That being settled, we anchored the boat and lit pipes, preparatory to passing as comfortable a night as might be under the circumstances. The only thing troubling me being the anxiety of the skipper on our behalf. Presently, the blackness beneath was lit up by a wide band of phosphoric light, shed in the wake of no ordinary-sized fish, probably an immense shark. Another, and another, followed in rapid succession, until the depths beneath were all ablaze with brilliant, foot-wide ribbons of green glare, dazzling to the eye and bewildering to the brain. Occasionally a gentle splash or ripple alongside, or a smart tap on the bottom of the boat, warned us how thick the concourse was that had gathered below. Until that weariness, which no terror is proof against, set in, sleep was impossible, nor could we keep our anxious gaze from that glowing inferno beneath, where one would have thought all the population of Tartarus were holding high revel. Mercifully, at last we sank into a fitful slumber, though fully aware of the great danger of our position. One upward rush of any of those ravening monsters, happening to strike the frail shell of our boat, and a few fleeting seconds would have sufficed for our obliteration, as if we had never been. But the terrible night passed away, and once more we saw the tender, iridescent light stream into that abode of dread. As the day strengthened, we were able to see what was going on below, and a grim vision it presented. The water was literally alive with sharks of enormous size tearing with never-ceasing energy at the huge carcass of the whale lying on the bottom, who had met his fate in a singular but not unheard-of way. At that last titanic effort of his, he had rushed downward with such terrific force that, striking his head on the bottom, he had broken his neck. I felt very grieved that we had lost the chance of securing him, but it was perfectly certain that before we could get help to raise him, all that would be left on his skeleton would be quite valueless to us. So with such patience as we could command, we waited near the entrance until the receding ebb made it possible for us to emerge once more into the blessed light of day. Frank T. Bullen, The Cruise of the Cachalot. From Toil 
he wins his spirit's light. From Busy Day, The Peaceful Night Rich from the very want of wealth In heaven's best treasures Peace and health Thomas Gray End of section 93 This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 94 Read from the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org This recording by Larry Hansen The Glove and the Lions King Francis was a hardy king and loved a royal sport. And one day, as his lion strove, sat looking on the court. The nobles filled the benches round, the ladies by their side, and amongst them Count de Lorge, with one he hoped to make his bride. And truly, twas a gallant thing to see that crowning show, valor and love, and a king above, and the royal beasts below. Ramped and roared the lions with horrid, laughing jaws, they bit, they glared, gave blows like beams, a wind went with their paws. With wallowing might and stifled roar, they rolled one on another, till all the pit with sand and mane was in a thunderous smother. The bloody foam above the bars came whizzing through the air. Said Francis then, good gentlemen, we're better here than there. De Lorge's love o'erheard the king, a beauteous, lively dame, with smiling lips and sharp, bright eyes, which always seemed the same. She thought, the count, my lover, is as brave as brave could be. He surely would do desperate things to show his love of me. Kings, ladies, lover, all look on, the chance is wondrous fine. I'll drop my glove to prove his love. Great glory will be mine. She dropped her glove to prove his love, then looked on him and smiled. He bowed and in a moment leaped among the lions wild. The leap was quick, return was quick. He soon regained his place. Then threw the glove, not with love, right in the lady's face. In truth, cried Francis, rightly done. Then he rose from where he sat. No love, quoth he, but vanity, sets love a task like that. End of chapter 94。Chapter 95 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellery Davidson Three Scenes in the Tyrol You are standing on a narrow, thread-like road, which has barely room to draw itself along between the rocky bank of the River Inn and the base of a frowning buttress of the Solstein, which towers many hundred feet perpendicularly above you. You throw your head far back and look up, and there you have a vision of a plumed hunter, lofty and chivalrous in his bearing, who is bounding heedlessly on after a chamois to the very verge of a precipice. Mark! He loses his footing. He rolls helplessly from rock to rock. There is a pause in his headlong course. What is it that arrests him? Ah! He puts forth his mighty strength and clings hand and foot with the grip of despair to a narrow ledge of rock, and there he hangs over the abyss. It is the Emperor Maximilian. The abbot of Wiltau comes forth from his cell, sees an imperial destiny suspended between heaven and earth, and, crossing himself with awe, bids prayers be put up for the welfare of a passing soul. Hark! There is a wild cry ringing through the upper air. Ha! Zips of Zurl, thou hunted and hunting outlaw, Art thou out upon the heights at this fearful moment? 
watch the hardy mountaineer he binds his crampons on his feet he is making his perilous way towards his failing emperor now bounding like a hunted chamois now creeping like an insect now clinging like a root of ivy now dropping like a squirrel he reaches the fainting monarch just as he relaxes his grasp on the jutting rock courage kaiser there is a hunter's hand for thee a hunter's iron-shod foot to guide thee to safety look they clamber up the face of the rock on points and ledges where scarce the small hoof of the chamois might find a hold and the peasant folk still maintain that an angel came down to their master's rescue we will however refer the marvellous escape to the interposing hand of a pitying providence zips the outlaw becomes count halur von hohenfeldsen lord of the wild cry of the lofty rock and in the old pension list of the proud house of habsburg may still be seen an entry to this effect that sixteen florins were paid annually to one zips Azurl. as you look up from the base of the martin's wand you may with pains distinguish a cross which has been planted on the narrow ledge where the emperor was rescued by the outlaw there is another vision an imperial one also the night is dark and wild gusty winds come howling down from the mountain passes driving sheets of blinding rain before them and whirling them round in hissing eddies at intervals the clouds are rent asunder and the moon takes a hurried look at the world below what does she see and what do we hear for there are other sounds stirring besides the ravings of the tempest in that wild cleft of the mountains which guard innsbruck on the corinthian side there is a hurried tramp of feet a crowding and crushing up through the steep and narrow gorge a mutter of suppressed voices a fitful glancing of torches which now flare up bravely enough now wither in a moment before the derisive laugh of the storm at the head of the melee there is a litter borne on the shoulders of a set of sure-footed hunters of the hills and around this litter is clustered a moving constellation of lamps which are anxiously shielded from the rude wrath of the tempest a group of stately figures wrapped in rich military cloaks with helms glistening in the torchlight and plumes streaming on the wind struggle onward beside the litter and who is this reclining there his teeth firmly set to imprison the stifled groan of physical anguish he is but fifty-three years of age but the lines of premature decay are ploughed deep along brow and cheek while his yellow locks are silvered and crisped with care who can mistake that full expansive forehead that aquiline nose that cold stern blue eye and that heavy obstinate austrian underlip for other than those of the mighty emperor charles v and can this suffering invalid flying from foes who are almost on the heels of his attendants jolted over craggy passes in midnight darkness buffeted by the tempest and withered by the sneer of adverse fortune can this be the emperor of germany king of spain lord of the netherlands of naples of lombardy and the proud chief of the golden western world yes charles thou art reading a stern lesson by that fitful torchlight but thy strong will is yet unbent and thy stern nature yet unsoftened and who is the swift avenger of blood who is following close as a sleuth hound on thy track it is maurice of saxony a match for thee in boldness of daring and in strength of will but charles wins the midnight race and yet instead of bowing before him whose long suffering would lead to repentance he ascribes his escape to the star of austria ever in the ascendant and mutters his favourite saying myself and the lucky moment one more scene it is the year eighteen o nine bonaparte has decreed in the secret council chamber where his own will is his sole adviser that the tyrol shall be cleared of its troublesome nest of warrior hunters ten thousand french and bavarian soldiers have penetrated as far as the upper inthal and are boldly pushing on towards prutz but the mountain walls of this profound valley are closing gloomily together as if they would forbid even the indignant river to force its wild way betwixt them is there a path through the frowning gorge other than that rocky way which is fiercely held by the current yes there is a narrow road painfully grooved by the hand of man out of the mountain-side 
now running along like a gallery, now dropping down to the brink of the stream. But the glittering array winds on. There is the heavy tread of the foot soldiers, the trampling of horse, the dull rumble of the guns, the waving and flapping of the colors, and the angry remonstrance of the inn. But all else is still as a midnight sleep, except, indeed, when the eagles of the crag, startled from the eyries, raise their shrill cry as they spread their living wings above the gilded eagles of France. Suddenly a voice is heard far up amid the mists of the heights, not the eagle's cry this time, not the freak of a wayward echo, but human words which say, Shall we begin? Silence. It is a host that holds its breath and listens. Was it a spirit of the upper air parlaying with its kind? If so, it has its answer countersigned across the dark gulf. Not night. Not yet. The whole invading army pause. There is a wavering and writhing in the glittering serpent length of that mighty force which is helplessly uncoiled along the base of the mountain. But hark! The voice of the hills is heard again, and it says, Now! Now then descends the wild avalanche of destruction, and all its tumult, dismay, and death. The very crags of the mountainside, loosened in preparation, come bounding, thundering down. Trunks and roots of pine trees, gathering speed on their headlong way, are launched down upon the powerless foe, mingled with the deadly hail of the Tyrolese rifles. And this fearful storm descends along the whole line at once. No marvel that two-thirds of all that brilliant invading army are crushed to death along the grooved pathway, or are tumbled, horse and man, into the choked and swollen river. Enough of horrors! Who would willingly linger on the hideous details of such a scene? Sorrowful that man should come, with his evil ambitions and his fierce revenges, to stain and to spoil such wonders of beauty as the hand of the Creator has here molded. Sorrowful that man, in league with the serpent, should writhe into such scenes as these and poison them with the virus of sin. Richter Who loves not knowledge? Who shall rail against her beauty? May she mix with men and prosper. Who shall fix her pillars? Let her work prevail. Let her know her place. She is the second, not the first. A higher hand must make her mild, if all be not in vain. And guide her footsteps, moving side by side with wisdom, like the younger child. Tennyson End of chapter 95「Chapter ninety six of the Ontario Readers Fourth Book Recorded for LibriVox org by Diana Schmidt Marston Moore A Cavalier Song To horse, to horse, Sir Nicholas, the clarion's note is high. To horse, to horse, Sir Nicholas. The big drum makes reply, ere this hath Lucas marched with his gallant cavaliers, and the bray of Rupert's trumpets grows fainter in our ears to horse to horse sir nicholas white guy is at the door and the raven wets his beak o'er the field of marston moor up rose the lady alice from her brief and broken prayer and she brought a silken banner down the narrow turret stair o oh, many were the tears that those radiant eyes had shed as she traced the bright word glory in the gay and glancing thread and mournful was the smile which o'er those lovely features ran as she said it is your lady's gift unfurl it in the van it shall flutter noble wench where the best and boldest ride midst the steel-clad files of skippon the black dragoons of pride the recreant heart of fairfax shall feel a sicklier qualm and the rebel lips of oliver give out a louder psalm when they see my lady's gigaw flaunt proudly on their wing and hear her loyal soldiers shout for god and for the king tis noon the ranks are broken along the royal line they fly the braggarts of the court the bullies of the rhine stout langdale's cheer is heard no more and astley's helm is down and rupert sheaths his rapier 
with a curse and with a frown and cold newcastle mutters as he follows in their flight the german boar had better far have supped in york to-night the knight is left alone his steel cap cleft in twain his good buff jerkin crimsoned o'er with many a gory stain yet still he waves his banner and cries amid the rout for church and king fair gentlemen spur on and fight it out and now he wards a roundhead's pike and now he hums a stave and now he quotes a stage play and now he fells a knave god aid thee now sir nicholas thou hast no thought of fear god aid thee now sir nicholas for fearful odds are here the rebels hem thee in and at every cut and thrust down down they cry with belial down with him to the dust i would quoth grim old oliver that belial's trusty sword this day were doing battle for the saints and for the lord the lady alice sits with her maidens in her bower the gray-haired warder watches from the castle's topmost tower what news what news old hubert the battle's lost and won the royal troops are melting like mists before the sun and a wounded man approaches i'm blind and cannot see yet sure i am that sturdy step my master's step must be i've brought thee back thy banner wench from as rude and red a fray as e'er was proof of soldier's thew or theme for minstrel's lay here hubert bring the silver bowl and liquor quantum suff i'll make a shift to drain it yet ere i part with boots and buff though guy through many a gaping wound is breathing forth his life and i come to thee a landless man my fond and faithful wife sweet we will find our money bags and freight a ship for france and mourn in merry paris for this poor land's mischance for if the worst befall me why better axe and rope than life with lenthal for a king and peters for a pope alas alas my gallant guy curse on the crop-eared boar who sent me with my standard on foot from marston moor w m prayed end of chapter ninety six this recording is in the public domain Chapter ninety seven of the Ontario Readers Fourth Book This is a Librivox recording. All Librivox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit Librivox.org. The Ontario Readers Fourth Book by Various London the huge city perhaps never impressed the imagination more than when approaching it by night on the top of a coach you saw its numberless lights flaring as tennyson says like a dreary dawn the most impressive approach is now by the river through the infinitude of docks quays and shipping london is not a city but a province of brick and stone hardly even from the top of st paul's or of the monument can anything like a view of the city as a whole be obtained it is indispensable however to make one or the other of those ascents when a clear day can be found not so much because the view is fine as because you will get a sensation of vastness and multitude not easily to be forgotten there is or was not long ago a point on the ridge that connects hampstead with highgate from which as you looked over london to the surrey hills beyond the modern babylon presented something like the aspect of a city the ancient babylon may have vied with london in circumference but the greater part of its area was occupied by open spaces 
the modern babylon is a dense mass of humanity london with its suburbs has five millions of inhabitants and still it grows it grows through the passion which seems to be seizing mankind everywhere on this continent as well as in europe for emigration from the country into the town not only as the centre of wealth and employment but as the centre of excitement and as the people fondly fancy of enjoyment the empire and the commercial relations of england draw representatives of trading communities or subject races from all parts of the globe and the faces and costumes of the hindu the parsi the lascar and the ubiquitous chinaman mingle in the motley crowd with the merchants of europe and america the streets of london are in this respect to the modern what the great place of tyre must have been to the ancient world but pile carthage on tyre venice on carthage amsterdam on venice and you will not make the equal or anything near the equal of london here is the great mart of the world to which the best and richest products are brought from every land and clime so that if you have put money in your purse you may command every object of utility or fancy which grows or is made anywhere without going beyond the circuit of the great cosmopolitan city parisian german russian hindu japanese chinese industry is as much at your service here if you have the all compelling talisman in your pocket as in paris berlin st petersburg benares yokohama or pekin that london is the great distributing centre of the world is shown by the fleets of the carrying trade of which the countless masts rise along her wharves and in her docks she is also the bank of the world but we are reminded of the vicissitudes of commerce and the precarious tenure by which its empire is held when we consider that the bank of the world in the middle of the last century was amsterdam the first and perhaps the greatest marvel of london is the commissariat how can the five millions be regularly supplied with food and everything needful to life even with such things as milk and those kinds of fruit which can hardly be left beyond a day here again we see reason for concluding that though there may be fraud and scamping in the industrial world genuine production faithful service disciplined energy and skill in organization cannot wholly have departed from the earth london is not only well fed but well supplied with water and well drained vastly and densely peopled as it is it is a healthy city yet the limit of practicable extension seems to be nearly reached it becomes a question how the increasing multitude shall be supplied not only with food and water but with air there is something very impressive in the roar of the vast city it is a sound of a niagara of human life it ceases not except during the hour or two before dawn when the last carriages have rolled away from the balls and the market carts have hardly begun to come in only in returning from a very late ball is the visitor likely to have a chance of seeing what wordsworth saw from westminster bridge earth has not anything to show more fair dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty this city now doth like a garment wear the beauty of the morning 
silent bare ships towers domes theatres and temples lie open unto the fields and to the sky all bright and glittering in the open air never did sun more beautifully steep in his first splendour valley rock or hill ne'er saw i never felt a calm so deep the river glideth at its own sweet will dear god the very houses seem asleep and all that mighty heart is lying still by goldwyn smith End of chapter 97chapter ninety eight of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for librivox dot org by betty b how they brought the good news from ghent to x i sprang to the stirrup and joris and he i galloped dirk galloped we galloped all three good speed cried the watch as the gate bolts undrew speed echoed the wall to us galloping through behind shut the poster and the lights sank to rest and into the midnight we galloped abreast not a word to each other we kept the great pace neck by neck stride by stride never changing our place i turned in my saddle and made its girths tight then shortened each stirrup and set the peak right we buckled the cheek strap chain slacker the bit nor galloped less steadily roland a whit twas moon set at starting but while we drew near lokeren the cock's crew and twilight dawn clear at boom a great yellow star came out to sea at dewfell twas morning as plain as could be and from mckelm church steeple we heard the half chime so joris broke silence with yet there is time at earshot up leaped of a sudden the sun and against him the cattle stood black every one to stare through the mist at us galloping past and i saw my stout galloper roland at last with resolute shoulders each budding away the haze as some bluff river headland its spray and his low head and crest just one sharp ear bent back for my voice and the other pricked out on his track and one eye's black intelligence ever that glance or its white edge at me his own master askance and the thick heavy spoon flakes which i and anon his fierce lip shook upwards in galloping on i hasselt dirk groaned and cried joris stay spur your ruse gallop bravely the fault's not in her will remember at x for one heard the quick wheeze of her chest saw the stretched neck and staggering knees and sunk tail and horrible heave of the flank as down on her haunches she shuddered and sank so we were left galloping joris and i past luz and past tongre no cloud in the sky the broad sun above laughed a pitiless laugh neath our feet broke the brittle bright stubble like chaff till over by dalham a dome spire sprang white and gallop gasped joris for x is in sight how they'll greet us and all in a moment his roan rolled neck and croup over lay dead as a stone and there was my roland to bear the whole weight of the news which alone could save x from her fate with his nostrils like pits full of blood to the brim and with circles of red for his eye sockets rim then i cast loose my buff coat each holster let fall shook off both my jack boots let go belt and all stood up in the stirrup leaned patted his ear called my roland his pet name my horse without peer clapped my hands laughed and sang any noise bad or good till at length into x roland galloped and stood and all i remember is friends flocking round as i sat with his head twixt my knees on the ground and no voice but was praising this roland of mine as i poured down his throat our last measure of wine which the burgesses voted by common consent was no more than his due who brought good news from ghent browning end of chapter ninety eight this recording is in the public domain Chapter ninety nine of the Ontario Readers Fourth Book Recorded for Librivox .org. An Incident of the French Camp You know We French stormed Ratisbon 
a mile or so away on a little mound napoleon stood on our storming day with neck out thrust you fancy how legs wide arms locked behind as if to balance the prone brow oppressive with its mind just as perhaps he mused my plans that soar to earth may fall let once my army leader lan waver at yonder wall out twixt the battery smokes there flew a rider bound on bound full galloping nor bridle drew until he reached the mound then off there flung in smiling joy and held himself erect by just his horse's mane a boy you scarcely could suspect so tight he kept his lips compressed scarce any blood came through you looked twice ere you saw his breast was all but shot in two well cried he emperor by god's grace we've got you ratisbon the marshal's in the market-place and you'll be there anon to see your flag-bird flap his vans where i to heart's desire perched him the chief's eye flashed his plans soared up again like fire the chief's eye flashed but presently softened itself as sheathes a film the mother eagle's eye when her bruised eaglet breathes you're wounded nay the soldier's pride touched to the quick he said i'm killed sire and his chief beside smiling the boy fell dead browning i made them lay their hands in mine and swear to reverence the king as if he were their conscience and their conscience as their king to ride abroad redressing human wrongs to speak no slander no nor listen to it tennyson end of chapter 99 this recording is in the public domain chapter 100 of the ontario readers fourth book this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Laszlo Beauregard. The Ontario Readers. Fourth Book. By Various. British and Colonial Naval Power. The sagacity of England is in nothing more clearly shown than in the foresight with which she has provided against the emergency of war let it come when it may it will not find her unprepared so thickly are her colonies and naval stations scattered over the face of the earth that her warships can speedily reach every commercial centre on the globe there is that great centre of commerce the mediterranean sea it was a great centre long ago when the phoenician traversed it and passing through the pillars of hercules sped on his way to the distant and then savage britain it was a great center when rome and carthage wrestled in a death grapple for its possession but at the present day england is as much at home on the mediterranean as if it were on one of her own canadian lakes nor is it simply the number of british colonies or the evenness with which they are distributed that challenges our admiration the positions which these colonies occupy and their natural military strength are quite as important facts there is not a sea or a gulf in the world which has any real commercial importance but england has a strong hold on its shores and wherever the continents trending southward come to points around which the commerce of nations must sweep there is a british settlement and the cross of st george salutes you as you are wafted by there is hardly a little desolate rocky island or peninsula formed apparently by nature for a fortress and nothing else but the british flag floats securely over it these are literal facts take for example the great overland route from europe to asia despite its name its real highway is on the waters of the mediterranean and red seas it has three gates three only england holds the key to every one of these gates count them Gibraltar, Malta, Aden. But she commands the entrance to the Red Sea not by one, but by several strongholds. Midway in the narrow strait is the black bare rock of Perim, sterile, precipitous, a perfect counterpart of Gibraltar. And on either side, between it and the mainland, are the ship channels which connect the Red Sea with the great Indian Ocean this rock england holds a little further out is the peninsula of aden another gibraltar as rocky as sterile 
and as precipitous, connected with the mainland by a narrow strait, and having a harbor safe in all winds, and a central coal depot. This England bought in 1839, and to complete her security, she has purchased from some petty sultan the neighboring islands of Socotra and Cori, giving, as it were, a retaining fee, so that, though she does not need them herself, no rival power may ever possess them. As we sail a little further on, we come to the China Sea. What a beaten track of commerce is this! What wealth of comfort and luxury is wafted over it by every breeze! The teas of China, the silks of farther India, the spices of the East. The ships of every clime and nation swarm on its waters. The stately barks of England, France, and Holland, the swift ships of America, and mingled with them, in picturesque confusion, the clumsy junk of the Chinamen, and the slender, darting canoe of the Malaysian islanders. At the lower end of the China Sea, where it narrows into Malacca Strait, England holds the little island of Singapore, a spot of no use to her whatsoever, except as a commercial depot, but of inestimable value for that, a spot which, under her fostering care, is growing up to take its place among the great emporiums of the world. Halfway up the sea she holds the island of Labuan, whose chief worth is this, that beneath its surface, and that of the neighboring mainland, there lie inexhaustible treasures of coal, which are likely to yield wealth and power to the hand that controls them. At the upper end of the sea she holds Hong Kong, a hot, unhealthy place, but an invaluable base from which to threaten and control the neighboring waters. Even in the broad and as yet comparatively untracked Pacific, she is making silent advances towards dominion. The vast continent of Australia, which she has secured, forms its southwestern boundary. And pushed out six hundred miles eastward from this lies New Zealand, like a strong outpost, its shores so scooped and torn by the waves that it must be a very paradise of commodious bays and safe havens for the mariner. The soil, too, is of extraordinary fertility, and the climate, though humid, deals kindly with the Englishman's constitution. Nor is this all, for, advanced from it, north and south, like picket stations, are Norfolk Island and the Auckland Group, both of which have good harbors. And it requires no prophet's eye to see that, when England needs posts farther eastward, she will find them among the green coral islets that stud the Pacific. Turn now your steps homeward, and pause a moment at the Bermudas, those beautiful isles, with their fresh verdure, green gems in the ocean, with air soft and balmy as Eden's was. They have their uses, too. They furnish arrowroot for the sick, and ample supplies of vegetables earlier than the sterner climates will yield them. Is this all that can be said? Reflect a little more deeply. These islands possess a great military and naval depot, and a splendid harbor, landlocked, strongly fortified, and difficult of access to strangers, and all within a few days' sail of the chief ports of the Atlantic shores of the New World. England therefore retains them as a station on the road to her West Indian possessions, and should America go to war with her, she would use it as a base for offensive operations, where she might gather and when she might hurl upon any unprotected port all her gigantic naval and military power. End of chapter 100of the Ontario Readers, fourth book, recorded for LibriVox.org by Nemo. England, my England. What have I done for you, England, my England? What is there I would not do, England, my own? With your glorious eyes austere, as the Lord were walking near, whispering terrible things and dear, as a song on your bugles blown. England, round the world on your bugles blown. Where shall the watchful sun, England, my England, 
match the master work you've done england my own when shall he rejoice again such a breed of mighty men as come forward one to ten to the song on your bugles blown england down the years on your bugles blown ever the faith endures england my england take and break us we are yours england my own life is good and joy runs high between english earth and sky death is death but we shall die to the song on your bugles blown england to the stars on your bugles blown they call you proud and hard england my england you with words to watch and ward england my own you whose mailed hands keep the keys of such teeming destinies you could know nor dread nor ease were the song and your bugles blown england round the pit on your bugles blown mother of ships whose might england my england is the fierce old sea's delight england my own chosen daughter of the lord spouse and chief of the ancient sword there's the menace of the word and the song on your bugles blown england out of heaven on your bugles blown w e henley end of chapter 101 this recording is in the public domain. Chapter 102 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson A Good Time Going Charles Mackay, at the end of his American tour in 1859, was entertained in Boston by the leading literary men. This poem, written for the occasion, was read to speed the parting guest. Brave singer of the coming time, sweet minstrel of the joyous present, crowned with the noblest wreath of rhyme, the holly leaf of Ayrshire's peasant, goodbye, goodbye, our hearts and hands, our lips in honest Saxon phrases, cry God be with him till he stands his feet among the English daisies. Tis here we part, for other eyes, the busy deck, the fluttering streamer, the dripping arms that plunge and rise, the waves in foam, the ship in tremor, the kerchiefs waving from the pier, the cloudy pillar gliding o'er him, the deep blue desert, lone and drear, with heaven above and home before him. His home, the western giant smiles and twirls the spotty globe to find it, this little speck the british isles tis but a freckle never mind it he laughs and all his prairies roll each gurgling cataract roars and chuckles and ridges stretched from pole to pole heave till they crack their iron knuckles but memory blushes at the sneer and honour turns with frown defiant and freedom leaning on her spear laughs louder than the laughing giant an islet is a world she said when glory with its dust has blended and britain keeps her noble dead till earth and seas and skies are rended beneath each swinging forest bough some arm as stout in death reposes from wave-washed foot to heaven-kissed brow her valor's life-blood runs in roses nay let our brothers of the west write smiling in their florid pages one half her soil has walked the rest in poets heroes martyrs sages hugged in the clinging billows clasp from seaweed fringe to mountain heather the british oak with rooted grasp her slender handful holds together with cliffs of white and bowers of green and ocean narrowing to caress her and hills that threaded streams between our little mother isle god bless her oliver wendell holmes 
End of chapter 102. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 103 of the Ontario Readers, Fourth Book. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. God is our refuge. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will we not fear, though the earth do change, and though the mountains be moved in the heart of the seas, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. There is a river, the streams whereof make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her at the dawn of morning. The nations raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariots in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Psalm 46 A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things and an evil man out of the evil treasures bringeth forth evil things. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. St. Matthew 12 End of chapter 103 This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 104 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book, recorded for LibriVox.org by Melissa Perry. Indian Summer By the purple haze that lies on the distant rocky height, by the deep blue of the skies, by the smoky amber light through the forest arches streaming, where nature on her throne sits dreaming, and the sun is scarcely gleaming through the cloudless snowy white winter's lovely herald greets us ere the ice-crowned giant meets us a mellow softness fills the air no breeze on wanton wings steals by to break the holy quiet there or make the waters fret and sigh or the yellow alders shiver that bend to kiss the placid river flowing on and on forever but the little waves are sleeping or the pebbles slowly creeping that last night were flashing leaping driven by the restless breeze in lines of foam beneath yon trees dressed in robes of gorgeous hue brown and gold with crimson blent the forest to the waters blue its own enchanting tints has lent in their dark depths lifelike glowing we see a second forest growing, each pictured leaf and branch bestowing a fairy grace to that twin wood, mirrored within the crystal flood. Tis pleasant now in forest shades. The Indian hunter strings his bow to track through dark entangling glades the antlered deer and bounding doe, or launch at night the birch canoe to spare the finny tribes that dwell on sandy bank in weedy cell or pool the fisher knows right well seen by the red and vivid glow of pine torch at his vessel's bow this dreamy indian summer day attunes the soul to tender sadness we love but joy not in the ray it is not summer's fervid gladness but a melancholy glory hovering softly round decay, like swan that sings her own sad story ere she floats in death away. The day declines. What splendid dyes in fleckered waves of crimson driven 
float o'er the saffron sea that lies glowing within the western heaven oh it is a perilous even see the broad red sun has set but his rays are quivering yet through nature's veil of violet streaming bright o'er lake and hill but earth and forest lie so still it sendeth to the heart a chill we start to check the rising tear tis beauty sleeping on her bier susanna moody so live that when thy summons comes to join the innumerable caravan which moves to that mysterious realm where each shall take his chamber in the silent halls of death thou go not like the quarry slave at night scourged to his dungeon but sustained and soothed by an unfaltering trust approach thy grave like one who wraps the drapery of his couch about him and lies down to pleasant dreams bryant end of chapter 104 this recording is in the public domain Chapter 105 of the Ontario Readers, Fourth Book, recorded for LibriVox.org by Diana Schmidt. The Skylark, bird of the wilderness, blithesome and cumberless, sweet be thy matin or moorland in lee, emblem of happiness, blessed is thy dwelling place, O oh, to abide in the desert with thee. Wild is thy lay and loud far in the downy cloud love gives it energy love gave it birth where on thy dewy wing where art thou journeying thy lay is in heaven thy love is on earth or fell in fountain sheen or moor in mountain green or the red streamer that heralds the day over the cloudlet dim over the rainbow's rim musical cherub soar singing away then when the gloaming comes low in the heather blooms sweet will thy welcome and bed of love be emblem of happiness blessed is thy dwelling place o oh, to abide in the desert with thee james hogg end of chapter one hundred five this recording is in the public domain Chapter 106 of the Ontario Readers, Fourth Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Laszlo Beauregard. The Ontario Readers, Fourth Book, by Various. What is War? by John Bright. What is War? I believe that half the people that talk about war have not the slightest idea what it is. In a short sentence, it may be summed up to be the combination and concentration of all the horrors, atrocities, crimes, and sufferings of which human nature on this globe is capable. If you go to war now, you will have more banners to decorate your cathedrals and churches. Englishmen will fight now as well as they ever did, and there is ample power to back them if the country can be sufficiently excited and deluded. You may rise up great generals. You may have another Wellington, and another Nelson, too. For this country can grow men capable of every enterprise. Then there may be titles and pensions and marble monuments to eternalize the men who have thus become great. But what becomes of you, and your country, and your children? You profess to be a Christian nation. You make it your boast, even though boasting is somewhat out of place in such questions. You make it your boast that you are a Christian people, and that you draw your rule of doctrine and practice as from a well pure and undefiled, from the lively oracles of God, and from the direct revelation of the Omnipotent. You have even conceived the magnificent project of illuminating the whole earth, even to its remotest and darkest recesses, by the dissemination of the volume of the New Testament in whose words every page are written forever the words of peace. Within the limits of this island alone, every Sabbath day, twenty thousand, yes, 
far more than twenty thousand temples are thrown open in which devout men and women assemble to worship him who is the prince of peace is this a reality or is your christianity a romance and your profession a dream no i am sure that your christianity is not a romance and i am equally sure that your profession is not a dream it is because i believe this that i appeal to you with confidence and that i have hope and faith in the future i believe that we shall see and at no very distant time sound economic principles spreading much more widely amongst the people a sense of justice growing up in a soil which hitherto had been deemed unfruitful and which will be better than all the churches of the united kingdom the churches of britain awaking as it were from their slumbers and girding up their loins to more glorious work when they shall not only accept and believe in the prophecy but labor earnestly for its fulfillment that there shall come a time a blessed time a time which shall last for ever when nations shall not lift up sword against nation neither shall they learn war any more end of chapter 106section 107 of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for librivox.org by rosalind walsh newfoundland and labrador canada the homes of england the homes of england the stately homes of england how beautiful they stand amidst their tall ancestral trees o'er all the pleasant land the deer across their greensward bound through shade and sunny gleam and the swan glides past them with the sound of some rejoicing stream the merry homes of england around their hearths by night what gladsome looks of household love meet in the ruddy light there woman's voice flows forth in song or childhood's tale is told or lips move tunefully along some glorious page of old the blessed homes of england how softly on their bowers is laid the holy quietness that breathes from sabbath hours solemn yet sweet the church bells chime floats through their woods at morn all other sounds in that still time of breeze and leaf are born the cottage homes of england by thousands on her plains they are smiling o'er the silvery brooks and round the hamlet fanes through growing orchards forth they peep each from its nook of leaves and fearless there the lowly sleep as the bird beneath the eaves the free fair homes of england long long in hut and hall may hearts of native proof be reared to guard each hollowed wall and green for ever be the groves and bright the flowery sod where first the child's glad spirit loves its country and its god felicia hemans End of section 107. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 108 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. To a Waterfowl. Whither midst falling dew, while grow the heavens with the last steps of day, Far through their rosy depths dost thou pursue thy solitary way. Vainly the fowler's eye might mark thy distant flight to do thee wrong, as darkly seen against the crimson sky thy figure floats along. Seekest thou the plashy brink of weedy lake or marge of river wide, or where the rocking billows rise and sink on the chafed ocean side? There is a power whose care teaches thy way along that pathless coast, the desert and illimitable air, lone wandering, but not lost. All day thy wings have fanned at that far height the cold, thin atmosphere, yet stoop not, weary to the welcome land, though the dark night is near, and soon that toil shall end. Soon shalt thou find a summer home and rest, and scream among thy fellows reeds shall bend soon o'er thy sheltered nest thou'rt gone the abyss of heaven hath swallowed up thy form yet on my heart deeply hath sunk the lesson thou hast given and shall not soon depart 
he who from zone to zone guides through the boundless sky thy certain flight in the long way that i must tread alone will lead my steps aright bryant end of chapter one hundred eight this recording is in the public domain section one o nine of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for LibriVox.org by april six zero nine zero the fascination of light the strange fascination of light takes hold of all animated creatures and commands a subtle devotion that cannot be set forth in a confession of faith the delight of a boy in a bonfire is a breath of the heaven that is about us in our infancy though it be but a heap of rubbish revealed by the removal of the mantle of snow lighting up with flickering changing glow a rectangular dooryard the children stand and gaze into the dancing flame their vast distorted ghost-like shadows lost in the night their faces reflecting every evanescent glare and their spirits charmed by the same spell that took form in the fire worship of their ancestors how they delight in stirring up the embers and sending up a fountain spray of sparks what joy in seeing the big sticks break into glowing coals darting out new tongues of flame to lick up the escaping embers fire is one of nature's universal fascinations the wildest and most wary animals approach and gaze at it in the night though it sometimes warns them off it always holds them by a spell the night migrating birds perish in scores against the plate glass of coast lighthouses swerving from the control of the all-powerful migratory instinct toward the fascinating glare that is their destruction it is not sportsmanlike to hang a lantern in the marsh and shoot the duck that gather under it but the night the silent marsh and the lantern have charms that the sportsman with his legal and mechanical paraphernalia can never understand fish are devoted fire worshippers and that boy who has never speared by a jack light is an object of compassion the earth and the waters under the earth have no more fascinating sight than the gray silent form of a pipe moving and motionless in the shallow water a shadow more tangible than himself thrown by a jack light on the mottled yellow rocks and sands of the bottom a passing breath of wind even the slightest motion of the punt breaks every shadow and in indentation into myriad fleeting ripples and waves of light transforming the slender silent fish into a sheaf of wriggling glimmers with the stealing of the surface the waiting pike and all the shadows and lights of the bottom grow once more still and distinct there floats the greatest cannibal of the fishes paying his devotion to the flame and above him stands the greatest cannibal of all created beings pointing his deadly spear there is no moon the stars cannot penetrate the thickening clouds the bay is still and its shores invisible the distant light of a farmhouse only serving to intensify the lonely silence the savage joy of that moment repays the boy for all his laborious preparations he brought two boards down the river from the mill and toiled at them with all the tools in the woodshed till the ends and edges were made smooth he collected lumber from all available sources for the ends and bottom fastening them on with a miscellaneous collection of nails and springs then he patiently picked an old piece of tarred rope into oakum and caulked it into the seams with a sharpened gate hinge he notched a pine tree gathered the gum and boiled it into pitch to make the joints tight that extraordinary pair of oars he sawed chopped and whittled from an old plank the spear is a family relic which he dug up and fitted with a white ash pole and the anchor is a long stone tied by the slack of a clothesline the jack is a basket made of old pale hoops and fastened to an upright stick to hold the burning pine knot yet we wonder why it is always the country boy who succeeds in the city will he too be lured by the seductive glimmer will he turn away from the conquest of nature and embark in the conquest of his fellow mortals will he go to a resort for his fishing and a preserve for his shooting will that bunch of hair protruding from under his hat be worn thin and gray in scrambling after the delights of the vein and the covetous will he devote his superb strength of body and mind to outstripping and circumventing his fellows in the pursuit of that transient glimmer that all alluring ignis fatches which the babylon world calls success s t wood 
End of section 109. This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 110 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Anne Fletcher. Daffodils by William Wordsworth. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high o'er vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze, continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. They stretched in never-ending line along the margin of the bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills, and dances with the daffodils. End of poem. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Proverbs 25 End of chapter 110 This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 111 of the Ontario Readers, Fourth Book Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson to the dandelion dear common flower that grows beside the way fringing the dusty road with harmless gold first pledge of blithesome may when children pluck and full of pride uphold high-hearted buccaneers or joy that they an eldorado in the grass have found which not the rich earth's ample round may match in wealth thou art more dear to me than all the prouder summer blooms that be Lowell. End of chapter 111. This recording is in the public domain. Section 112 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosalind Walsh, Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. The Ontario Reader's Fourth Book by Various. Section 112. True Greatness. On the evening of the 22nd of May, 1509, two figures were seated at the wide doorway of a handsome house in Florence. Lilo, a boy of fifteen, sat on the ground with his back against the angle of the doorpost, and his long legs stretched out, while he held a large book open on the knee, and occasionally made a dash with his hand at an inquisitive fly, with an air of interest, stronger than that excited by the finely printed copy of Petrarch, which he kept open at one place, as if he were learning something by heart. Romola sat nearly opposite Lilo, but she was not observing him. Her hands were crossed on her lap, and her eyes were fixed absently on the distant mountains. She was evidently unconscious of anything around her. An eager life had left its mark upon her. The fondly moulded cheek had sunk a little. The golden crown was less massive. But there was a placidity on Romola's face which had never belonged to it in youth. It is but once that we can know our worst sorrows, and Romola had known them while life was new. Absorbed in this way, she was not at first aware that Lilo had ceased to look at his book and was watching her with a slightly impatient air, which meant that he wanted to talk to her, but was not quite sure whether she would like that entertainment just now. But persevering looks make themselves felt at last. 
Romola did presently turn away her eyes from the distance and met Lilo's impatient dark gaze with a brighter and brighter smile. He shuffled along the floor, still keeping the book on his lap, till he got close to her and lodged his chin on her knee. "'What is it, Lilo?' said Romola, pulling his hair back from his brow. Lilo was a handsome lad, but his features were turning out to be more massive and less regular than his father's. The blood of the Tuscan peasant was in his veins. "'Mamma, Romola, what am I to be?' he said, well contented that there was a prospect of talking till it would be too late to calm Petrarch any longer. "'What should you like to be, Lilo? You might be a scholar. My father was a scholar, you know, and taught me a great deal. That is the reason why I can teach you.' "'Yes,' said Lilo, rather hesitantly, "'but he is old and blind in the picture. Did he get a great deal of glory?' not much lilo the world was not always very kind to him and he saw meaner men than himself put into higher places because they could flatter and say what was false and then his dear son thought it right to leave him and become a monk and after that my father being blind and lonely felt unable to do the things that would have made his learning of greater use to men so that he might still have lived in his works after he was in his grave i should not like that sort of life said lilo i should like to be something that would make me a great man and very happy besides something that would not hinder me from having a good deal of pleasure that is not easy my lilo it is only a poor sort of happiness that could ever come by caring very much about our own narrow pleasures we can have the highest happiness such as goes along with being a great man only by having wide thoughts and much feeling for the rest of the world as well as ourselves and this sort of happiness often brings so much pain with it that we can tell it from pain only by its being what we would choose before everything because our souls see it is good there are so many things wrong and difficult in the world that no man can be great he can hardly keep himself from wickedness unless he gives up thinking much about pleasure or rewards and get strength to endure what is hard and painful. My father had the greatness that belongs to integrity. He chose poverty and obscurity rather than falsehood. And so, my Lilo, if you mean to act nobly and seek to know the best things God has put within reach of men, you must learn to fix your mind on that end, and not on what will happen to you because of it. And remember, if you were to choose something lower and make it the rule of your life, to seek your own pleasure and escape from what is disagreeable calamity might come just the same and it would be calamity falling on a base mind which is the one form of sorrow that has no balm in it and that may well make a man say it would have been better for me if i had never been born i will tell you something lilo romola paused for a moment she had taken lilo's cheeks between her hands and his young eyes were meeting hers there was a man to whom I was very near, so that I could see a great deal of his life, who made almost every one fond of him, for he was young and clever and beautiful, and his manners to all were gentle and kind. I believe when I first knew him he never thought of doing anything cruel or base, but because he tried to slip away from everything that was unpleasant and cared for nothing else so much as his own safety, he came at last to commit some of the basest deeds such as make men infamous he denied his father and left him to misery he betrayed every trust that was reposed in him that he might keep himself safe and get rich and prosperous yet calamity overtook him george eliot romola end of section one hundred and twelve Chapter 113 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book Recorded for LibriVox.org The Private of the Buffs Last night among his fellows rough He jested, quaffed, and swore A drunken private of the buffs Who never looked before Today, beneath the foeman's frown 
he stands in elgin's place ambassador from britain's crown and type of all her race poor reckless rude low-born untaught bewildered and alone a heart with english instinct fraught he yet can call his own ay tear his body limb from limb bring cord or axe or flame he only knows that not through him shall england come to shame far kentish hopfields round him seemed like dreams to come and go bright leagues of cherry blossom gleamed one sheet of living snow the smoke above his father's door in grey soft eddyings hung must he then watch it rise no more doomed by himself so young yes on a cause with strength like steel he put the vision by let dusky indians whine and kneel an english lad must die and thus with eyes that would not shrink with knee to man unbent unfaltering on its dreadful brink to his red grave he went vain mightiest fleets of iron framed vain those all-shattering guns unless proud england keep untamed the strong heart of her sons so let his name through europe ring a man of mean estate who died as firm as sparta's king because his soul was great by f h doyle end of chapter 113 this recording is in the public domain section 114 of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for librivox.org by april 6090 honorable toil two men i honor and no third first the tale-worn craftsman that with earth-made implement laboriously conquers the earth and makes her man's venerable to me is the hard hand crooked coarse wherein notwithstanding lies a cunning virtue indefeasibly royal as of the sceptre of this planet venerable too is the rugged face all weather tanned besoiled with its rude intelligence for it is the face of a man living manlike oh but the more venerable for thy rudeness and even because we must pity as well as love thee hardly entreated brother for us was thy back so bent for us were thy straight limbs and fingers so deformed thou wert our conscription on whom the lot fell and fighting our battles wert so marred for in thee too lay a god-creatured form but it was not to be unfolded encrusted must it stand with the thick adhesions and defacements of labor and thy body like thy soul was not to know freedom yet toil on toil on thou art in the duty be out of it who may thou toilest for the altogether indispensable for daily bread a second man i honor and still more highly him who is seen toiling for the spiritually indispensable not daily bread but the bread of life is not he too in his duty endeavoring towards inward harmony revealing this by act or by word through all his outward endeavors be they high or low highest of all when his outward and his inward endeavor are one when we can name him artist not earthly craftsman only but inspired thinker who with heaven-made implement conquers heaven for us if the poor and humble toil that we have food must not the high and glorious toil for him in return that he have light have guidance freedom immortality these two in all their degrees i honor all else is chaff and dust which let the wind blow whither it listeth unspeakably touching is it however when i find both dignities united and he that must toil outwardly for the lowest of man's wants is also toiling inwardly for the highest sublimer in this world now i know nothing than a peasant saint could such now anywhere be met with such a one will take thee back to nazareth itself 
thou wilt see the splendor of heaven spring forth from the humblest depths of earth like a light shining in great darkness carlyle sartor resartus end of section 114 this recording is in the public domain chapter 115 of the ontario readers fourth book Recorded for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson On His Blindness When I consider how my light is spent Ere half my days in this dark world and wide And that one talent which is death to hide Lodged with me useless Though my soul more bent to serve there with my maker And present my true account Lest he returning chide Doth God exact day labor, light denied? I fondly ask. But patience to prevent that murmur soon replies. God doth not need either man's work or his own gifts. Who best bear his mild yoke, they serve him best. His state is kingly, thousands at his bidding speed, and post o'er land and ocean without rest. They also serve who only stand and wait. Milton So shall inferior eyes, that borrow their behavior from the great, grow great by your example, and put on the dauntless spirit of resolution. Shakespeare End of chapter 115 This recording is in the public domain. Section 116 of the Ontario Readers, Fourth Book, recorded for LibriVox.org by April 6090. Mysterious Night Mysterious Night, when our first parents knew thee from reports divine and heard thy name. Did he not tremble for this lovely frame, this glorious canopy of light and blue? Yet neath the curtain of translucent dew, bathed in the rays of the great setting flame hesperus with the host of heaven came and lo creation widened in man's view who could have thought such darkness lay concealed within thy beams o sun or who could find whilst flower and leaf and insect stood revealed that to such countless orbs thou madest us blind why do we then shun death with anxious strife if light can thus deceive wherefore not life Joseph Blanco White. End of section 116. This recording is in the public domain. Section 117 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Rosalind Walsh, Newfoundland and Labrador, Canada. Vitae Lampada. Vitae Lampada, the torch of life. There's a breathless hush in the close to-night, Ten to make and the match to win, A bumping pitch and a blinding light, An hour to play and the last man in. And it's not for the sake of a ribboned coat, Or the selfish hope of a season's fame, But his captain's hand on his shoulder smote, Play up, play up, and play the game. The sand of the desert is sodden red, red with the wreck of a square that broke, the gatlings jammed and the colonel dead, and the regiment blind with dust and smoke. The river of death has brimmed his banks, and England's far and honor a name, but the voice of a schoolboy rallies the ranks, play up, play up, and play the game. This is the word that year by year, while in her place the school is set, Every one of her sons must hear, and none that hears it dare forget. This they all with a joyful mind bear through life like a torch in flame, and falling fling to the host behind, play up, play up, and play the game. Henry Newbolt End of section 117 This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 118 of the Ontario Reader's Fourth Book. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Ontario Reader's Fourth Book by Various. The Irreparable Past. And he cometh the third time, and saith unto him, Sleep on now, and take your rest. It is enough, the hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. Mark 14, 41, 42 The words of Christ are not like the words of other men. His sentences do not end with the occasion which called them forth. Every sentence of Christ's is a deep principle of human life and it is so with these sentences the principle contained in sleep on now is this that the past is irreparable and after a certain moment waking will do no good you may improve the future the past is gone beyond recovery as to all that has gone by so far as the hope of alternate goes you may sleep on and take your rest there is no power in earth or heaven that can undo what has once been done. Let us proceed to give an illustration of this. This principle applies to a misspent youth. The young are by God's providence exempted in a great measure from anxiety. They are as the apostles were in relation to their master. Their friends stand between them and the struggles of existence they are not called upon to think for themselves the burden is borne by others they get their bread without knowing or caring how it is paid for they smile and laugh without a suspicion of the anxious thoughts of day and night which a parent bears to enable them to smile so to speak they are sleeping and it is not a guilty sleep while another watches my young brethren Youth is one of the precious opportunities of life, rich in blessing if you choose to make it so. But having it in the materials of undying remorse, if you suffer it to pass unimproved, your quiet Gethsemane is now. Do you know how you can imitate the apostles in their fatal sleep? You can suffer your young days to pass idly and uselessly away, you can live as if you had nothing to do but to enjoy yourselves. You can let others think for you, and not try to become thoughtful yourselves. Till the business and difficulties of life come upon you, unprepared, and you find yourselves like men waking from sleep, hurried, confused, scarcely able to stand, with all the faculties bewildered, not knowing right from wrong, led headlong to evil, just because you have not given yourselves in time to learn what is good all that is sleep and now let us mark it you cannot repair that in after life oh remember every period of human life has its own lesson and you cannot learn that lesson in the next period the boy has one set of lessons to learn and the young man another and the grown-up man another let us consider one single instance. The boy has to learn docility, gentleness of temper, reverence, submission. All those feelings which are to be transferred afterwards in full cultivation to God, like plants nursed in a hotbed and then planted out, are to be cultivated first in youth. Afterwards, those habits which have been merely habits of obedience to an earthly parent are to become religious submission to a heavenly parent. Our parents stand to us in the place of God. Veneration of our parents is intended to become afterwards adoration for something higher. Take that single instance, and now suppose that that is not learned in boyhood. Suppose that the boy sleeps to the duty of veneration, and learns only flippancy, insubordination and the habit of deceiving his father can that my young brethren be repaired afterwards humanly speaking not life is like the transition from class to class in a school 
the schoolboy who has not learned arithmetic in the earlier classes cannot secure it when he comes to mechanics in the higher each section has its own sufficient work he may be a good philosopher or a good historian but a bad arithmetician he remains for life for he cannot lay the foundation at the moment when he must be building the superstructure the regiment which has not perfected itself in its manoeuvres on the parade ground cannot learn them before the guns of the enemy and just in the same way the young person who has slept his youth away and become idle and selfish and hard cannot make up for it afterwards he may do something he may be religious yes but he cannot be what he might have been there is a part of his heart which will remain uncultivated to the end the apostles could share their master's sufferings they could not save him youth has its irreparable past and therefore my young brethren let it be impressed upon you now is a time infinite in its value for eternity which will never return again sleep not learn that there is a very solemn work of heart which must be done while the stillness of the garden of gethsemane gives you time now or never the treasures at your command are infinite treasures of time treasures of youth treasures of opportunity that grown-up men would sacrifice everything they have to possess oh for ten years of youth back again with the added experience of age but it cannot be they must be content to sleep on now and take their rest Reverend F. W. Robertson, Sermons End of chapter 118chapter 98 of the ontario readers fourth book recorded for librivox.org by betty b how they brought the good news from ghent to x i sprang to the stirrup and joris and he i galloped dirk galloped we galloped all three good speed cried the watch as the gate bolts undrew speed echoed the wall to us galloping through behind shut the poster and the lights sank to rest and into the midnight we galloped abreast not a word to each other we kept the great pace neck by neck stride by stride never changing our place i turned in my saddle and made its girths tight then shortened each stirrup and set the peak right we buckled the cheek strap chain slacker the bit nor galloped less steadily roland a wit twas moon set at starting but while we drew near locrin the cock's crew and twilight dawn clear at boom a great yellow star came out to sea at dewfell twas morning as plain as could be and from mckelm church steeple we heard the half chime so joris broke silence with yet there is time at earshot upleaped of a sudden the sun and against him the cattle stood black every one to stare through the mist at us galloping past and i saw my stout galloper roland at last with resolute shoulders each budding away the haze as some bluff river headland its spray and his low head and crest just one sharp ear bent back for my voice and the other pricked out on his track and one eye's black intelligence ever that glance or its white edge at me his own master askance and the thick heavy spoon flakes which i and anon his fierce lip shook upwards in galloping on by hasselt dirk groaned and cried joris stay spur your ruse gallop bravely the fault's not in her will remember at x for one heard the quick wheeze of her chest saw the stretched neck and staggering knees and sunk tail and horrible heave of the flank as down on her haunches she shuddered and sank so we were left galloping joris and i past luz and past tongre no cloud in the sky the broad sun above laughed a pitiless laugh neath our feet broke the brittle bright stubble like chaff till over by dalham a dome spire sprang white and gallop gasped joris for x is in sight how they'll greet us and all in a moment his roan rolled neck and croup over lay dead as a stone and there was my roland to bear the whole weight of the news which alone could save x from her fate 
with his nostrils like pits full of blood to the brim and with circles of red for his eye sockets rim then i cast loose my buff coat each holster let fall shook off both my jack boots let go belt and all stood up in the stirrup leaned patted his ear called my roland his pet name my horse without peer clapped my hands laughed and sang any noise bad or good till at length into x roland galloped and stood and all i remember is friends flocking round as i sat with his head twixt my knees on the ground and no voice but was praising this roland of mine as i poured down his throat our last measure of wine which the burgesses voted by common consent was no more than his due who brought good news from ghent browning end of chapter ninety eight this recording is in the public domain chapter one hundred twenty of the ontario readers fourth book this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the ontario readers fourth book by various the quarrel cassius read by larry wilson brutus read by nemo enter brutus and cassius that you have wronged me doth appear in this you have condemned and noted lucius pella for taking bribes here of the sardians wherein my letters praying on his side because i knew the man were slighted off you wronged yourself to write in such a case in such a time as this it is not meet that every nice offence should bear his comment let me tell you cassius you yourself are much condemned to have an itching palm to sell and march your offices for gold to undeservers ay an itching palm you know that you are brutus that speak this for by the gods this speech were else your last the name of cassius honours this corruption and chastisement doth therefore hide his head chastisement remember march the ides of march remember did not great julius bleed for justice sake what villain touched his body that did stab and not for justice what shall one of us that struck the foremost man of all this world but for supporting robbers shall we now contaminate our fingers with base bribes and sell the mighty space of our large honours for so much trash as may be grasped thus i'd rather be a dog and bay the moon than such a roman brutus bay not to me i'll not endure it you forget yourself to hedge me in i am a soldier i older in practice abler than yourself to make conditions go to you are not cassius i am i say you are not urge me no more i shall forget myself have mind upon your health tempt me no farther away slight man is it possible hear me for i will speak must i give way in room to your rash collar shall i be frighted when a madman stares oh ye gods ye gods must i endure all this all this ay more fret till your proud heart break go show your slaves how choleric you are and make your bondmen tremble must i budge must i observe you must i stand and crouch under your testy humour by the gods you shall digest the venom of your spleen though it do split you for from this day forth i'll use you for my mirth yea for my laughter when you are waspish is it come to this you say you are a better soldier let it appear so make your vaunting true and it shall please me well for mine own part i shall be glad to learn of noble men you wrong me every way you wrong me brutus i said an elder soldier not a better did i say better if you did i care not 
when caesar lived he durst not thus have moved me peace peace you durst not so have tempted him i durst not no what durst not tempt him for your life you durst not do not presume too much upon my love i may do that i shall be sorry for you have done that you should be sorry for there is no terror cassius in your threats for i am armed so strong in honesty that they pass by me as the idle wind which i respect not i did send to you for certain sums of gold which you denied me for i can raise no money by vile means by heaven i had rather coin my heart and drop my blood for drachmas than to wring from the hard hands of peasants their vile trash by any indirection i did send to you for gold to pay my legions which you denied me was that done like cassius should i have answered caius cassius so when marcus brutus grows so covetous to lock such rascal counters from his friends be ready gods of all your thunderbolts dash him to pieces i denied you not you did i did not he was but a fool that brought my answer back brutus hath rived my heart a friend should bear his friend's infirmities but brutus makes mine greater than they are i do not till you practice them on me you love me not i do not like your faults a friendly eye could never see such faults a flatterer's would not though they do appear as huge as high olympus come antony and young octavius come revenge yourselves alone on cassius for cassius is a weary of the world hated by the one he loves braved by his brother checked like a bondman all his faults observed set in a notebook learned and conned by rote to cast into my teeth oh i could weep my spirit from mine eyes there is a dagger and here my naked breast within a heart dearer than plutus mine richer than gold if that thou beest a roman take it forth i that denied thee gold will give my heart strike as thou didst at caesar for i know when thou didst hate him worst thou lovedst him better than ever thou lovedst cassius sheath your dagger be angry when you will it shall have scope do what you will dishonor shall be humor o oh, cassius you are yoked with a lamb that carries anger as the flint bears fire who much enforced shows a hasty spark and straight is cold again hath cassius lived to be but mirth and laughter to his brutus when grief and blood ill-tempered vexeth him when i spoke that i was ill-tempered too do you confess so much give me your hand and my heart too oh brutus what's the matter have not you love enough to bear with me when that rash humour which my mother gave me makes me forgetful yes cassius and from henceforth when you are over earnest with your brutus he'll think your mother chides and leave you so shakespeare julius caesar act four scene three end of chapter one hundred and twenty